Well, I'll introduce myself. My name's Ellen Gillette Woodard. I'm the Senior Objects Conservator here at the Williamstown Art Conservation Center. The Conservation Center has been established since the early 70s, 1970s, as one of the regional centers that was set up during that time to uh, provide conservation at, for small museums um, and uh, historical sites, as well as we also branched out to doing private clients and um, other uh, corporate entities. So we're basically a, an all round conservation provider for this region. The region basically is right now, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. So those are the states in which we have worked with or have a member client. Now a member client is somebody who basically supports the institution. We're non for profit so we're not doing conservation to make money. We're doing conservation to provide a service for um, other non for profit institutions, which is our main goal. And um, so I work mainly with objects. We also, though, have a paintings conservation lab, a paper conservation lab, and a wooden artifacts furniture lab. Some We have had on staff um, textile conservators, phot photographic conservators, and some other specialties as well. I'm very much a generalist, and mostly right now I'm working with uh, inorganic materials such as metal, stone, glass, ceramics, and um, I tend to also do some montages like multimedia materials too, so I will definitely work with organics as well at that point. So that's basically what I do here. Um, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for agreeing to talk with us today. We're very excited um, just like talk with you and learn more about the work you do. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Javier Rovello. I'm a freshman at Williams. I'm not a freshman. I'm a junior at Williams. <laughs> Sorry, it's old habits. Um, I'm a junior at Williams, I'm a art history and studio art major, and I'm originally from Manawa, Nicaragua. Um, I'm very passionate about museums and, I, and I'm and i here today as part of um, eight uh, Wigmas Agents for Creative Actions. Um, and we're doing just a series of interviews with different artists, uh, conservators, and just different people thinking and working with about, thinking, working, and just with art and about art. and. We're excited to talk with you today. Um, so now I'll let Emily introduce themselves and then we can move on to the questions. All right, hi, I'm Emily. I'm a freshman at Williams College. Um, I'm a hopeful art history and econ double major, but I've always been interested in museums and how they work. So this is a really interesting opportunity for me. Terrific, okay. Well, um, what would you like to know first? <laughs> Um, your role sounds incredibly interesting and the work you've done sounds really cool. So we wanted to know, how did you decide to become an art conservator? Well, I was about a, a junior, I think. I was actually a science major and my interest was in um, biology and actually ecology. And that was what my degree was. But I was also loved, I was an artist. So I also was taking for my extra credit courses studio art and art history. And then I, I basically was kind of working with both fields and deciding I really wanted to find something where I could combine my two interests and loves. And uh, art conservation is one of the really amazing fields where you are both an applied science as well as an artist when you're working on and preserving artwork. So this was just seemed to fit and just so I actually got two degrees <laughs> <laughs> before I went into graduate school. Now there's only three, well, there's actually now I think four full um, eclectic grad graduate schools for art conservation. And those would be um, Winter University of Delaware, Conservation School, the University of New York at Buffalo Conservation School. And then there's also the New York Queens University, well, New York University in, in New York City. Then in Canada, there's a Queens, which is in Ontario. 
And uh, there's also, I think, an ethnographic program out in UCLA. So those are the main programs for conservation. Most conservators have to go through, not only finish their undergrad with specific both chemistry and art studio and art history classes as their background, but also they need to work with um, a conservation lab or conservator for at least, um, I think it's over 200 hours before they can really even be considered an applicant for one of these graduate programs. So that's how I got in. Great, that sounds so cool. Um, it sounds like it's been such a long process to um, become a conservator. So now that you are one, now that you've been working for so many years, what is it like to work in an art conservation center and what kind of clientele do you typically get? Is it like the Wickma and the Clark or do you get like private um, um, customers, et cetera? Well, you're right. We get a, a variety in a, in a regional service. We basically have our member clients, which are basically clients that have pulled together to support the, the center. But then we, so most of those happen to be small museums. Uh, some of them are affiliated with colleges in the area such as WICMA. Some of them are small museums like the clock and um, other museums are like uh, historical sites, but tends to be the me member clients are the uh, small museums that they need the conservation lab. They, they, so they provide for the service and they, they get the services of the conservators here on staff when they need them. Um, we sometimes will do will do private work, which is you know somebody a collector or a, a person who has a you know personal object from they've inherited from their mother or father that they want uh, cleaned or restored will also come in here. So um, okay. it's, it's pretty general. Could you talk a little bit about what your day to day looks like at the conservation center? It is never the same. That's well, and with the objects in particular, it's never the same. I might be working on a stone sculpture one day, outdoors cleaning a bronze sculpture another day, working on a contemporary art multimedia time-based sculpture another day, or even in the same day, depending on. So it's, it's one of the things about objects conservation that I've always loved has been that it's never the same treatment twice. So you're always learning, you're always researching, you're always talking with your colleagues about what's the best practices for that sort of treatment. And um, it's, it's just an exciting kind of job because you're never, never doing the same thing. Well, that sounds so fun to like get to interact with so many different kinds of objects and have different kinds of processes to um, conserve them. So if you can, um, what do you think is, what has been your most um, exciting or favorite conservation project to date? I saw that question. I got to admit, everybody asks it, and I never know the right answer for that question. Um, the, I've been in the field a very long time, so I've been able to do some amazing things because I've been in my field. Um, I have been able to go to the top hat and be in the rim of a hat on an outdoor sculpture that was on the top was the finial of a Capitol building in Philadelphia, for Benjamin Franklin sculpture, which means I was probably 40 stories above the whole city looking down at it. I've been to China to work with uh, conservators and uh, museum people there. I've also been to Nigeria. Um, I've worked on major objects from as old as 4,000 years ago to contemporary art. Um, so there's not really one true project that I could say I've enjoyed. I've enjoyed the, tra the travel of seeing all of these different types of opportunities come my way. That sounds so exciting. I feel like I keep repeating exciting, but it just sounds like your work has been so interesting and that you've had all these wonderful experiences. So. If you could say one thing to students who might be interested in, in conservation or interested in the same path that you've taken, what would you tell them? Well, definitely keep your, your eye, eye on what you want. Um, there's, there, it is a lot of hard work to get into the field, 
But if you really truly want to be a conservator, you will be able to then probably it, things will just fall into place for what you need to, to get to achieve to get into graduate school. And once there, just there's just so many opportunities and so many different ways to practice con conservation in, in the field. You can be a private conservator, you could be working with a museum in a museum conservation lab, or you could be like I am doing working in a regional center. So there's, there's a number of different types of jobs in this field. There's also jobs dealing with just preventative conservation, which means you're trying to maintain and preserve a collection. There's jobs in contemporary art, which is a specialty, as well as ethnographic art is another specialty. So you've got, got a lot of opportunities there. That, that's great, great to hear, knowing there's so many routes that can be taken. Um, I guess, um, what, what would you say is the most challenging part of being an art conservator? That's a big responsibility if you think about it. You're dealing with um, somebody else's object that they love, they're willing to put money to get fixed. If that's just a private person, but then if you're dealing with the museum and you're dealing with very high quality, one of a kind pieces, you always need to be conscious of what you're doing and you always need to be aware that you have to think ahead. You always have to know what you're doing and how you're doing it. And it's a very, it's a big responsibility to take on treating or caring for somebody's collection or artwork. For sure. <laughs> I can imagine just how like, I, I, I can't even imagine, to be honest, just how, like how much responsibility it, would, it must be just dealing with all of this work. Um, I, I would love to hear like some maybe specific anecdotes about just like different works, maybe so, some things we might have seen at Wikima. Um, I, I know you've been, you recently worked on a work by Peter Coffin titled warm white painting and mm -hmm. someone mentioned it, it was a bit of a crazy it was crazy um, process I, I would love to hear you talk well, about it if you've seen warm white painting you know that it's a combination of not only a conceptual idea which is the artist wanted the painting to be warm but then you're also dealing with an electronic component which gives you it as this kind of a uh, time-based media too because sometimes it's warm when the the uh, hot plate's on and sometimes it's cold so the concept for the artist was it had to be warm he didn't care whether his hot plate was the same hot plate that was warming his painting he just wanted the painting to be warm because that was the concept of the painting however the hot plate that he had originally installed in the painting burnt out and so there was discussion as to, you really can't fix these commercial hot plates. They just, you know, they're not made to be repaired. So we had to try and recreate the idea of a hot plate. And since we also wanted it to be easily repairable so that the next person who comes down the line doesn't have to go into the extent of treatment that I did, we tried to make it a, a new hot plate to be basically able to be repaired easily if something broke or you know, it burned out. So that was the whole idea of it. So it was a kind of combination of working with the curator, understanding the goal and concept of the artist, and then trying to cre create out of what would have been a, a legitimate hot plate that would be behind this painting. So it was a yeah. combination. No, that, that sounds a kind of a, an intense process. I'm curious about like, by the nature of your work, I can imagine you have to like, um, often like interact a lot with like curators and artists to decide what the best approach is mm -hmm. towards preserving a piece. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about these relationships and how they play into your everyday work. Well, they, they play in a great deal to this decision-making of the work as to, um, and one of the major 
um, parts and points when you're work, starting to look and trying to figure out how to work on a piece is that, that decision-making process. The decision-making process could be a combination of working with the curator, the owner, or even the registrar as to you know, what are the goals for the treatment. You need to know what, where you want to take the piece or what really needs to be done. And then you also have to do a risk assessment as to whether the doing of the proposal is actually safe. And if you will get, or the benefit is justifies the treatment. Because no treatment is ever completely without risk. And also, if let's say there's no real treatment in which you're not doing something to the piece that's going to change it. So even what they say, oh, we just cleaned it. Cleaning in and of itself cannot be uh, redone. Once you've cleaned or removed a dirt layer, you've cleaned and removed that dirt layer. But if let's say underneath that dirt layer was a historic dirt layer, which you've seen a lot of ethnographic pieces and, and historical pieces, then you really can't clean that what I would call museum dirt off of the historical or ethnographic layer. So you've got to realize how far you need, you can safely take whatever treatment you choose to do. And um, so it does require at that point in time, major discussion with the curator and developing up the goals for the project. So you want some antidote, antidotes, not antidotes, antidotes. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Um, I think contemporary art's got the most interesting um, ways of going about things because not only do you have to sometimes work with what the artist wants, which is a warm painting, he definitely said the piece is not his unless it has a heat element to it. And it has to be turned on during display. You can't just hang the painting with an electrical cord attached to the base of the painting and say, this is his painting, warm painting. He, it, it had to have a heat element. However, his painting was painted with a white acrylic. Acrylic is a thermoplastic resin that's been bulked with a white pigment to make white paint. That's temperature sensitive. So overheating the painting would actually damage the painting and also accelerate the deterioration of the painting. So you had to tell him, that, okay, we can heat the painting, but we have to do it in a, in, a, in a certain level when which will not slowly damage or deteriorate that painting at the same time. So that was a discussion that had to be made in terms of, you know, what's the risk of really, you know, going back and using his hot plate or something similar to the hot plate. And these hot plates can have temperatures up to 250 degrees, while a painting really can't withstand more than maybe 120 at the most, and really, to be honest, 100 is about where you want to keep the, the heat level. So there had to be negotiations and compromises with the, uh, the artist and the curator was definitely a part of that involvement too, because she wants to keep the painting the way the artist sees it or the conceptualness of the artwork. But um, she also wants to preserve it for the museum's collection at the same time. And then I come in and I say, well, okay, we can create an, an element that heats the painting. However, you need to know the chemistry involved in preserving that paint its surface and the paint itself. And if you have your heat element in the 200 range, you're gonna basically lose the painting in less than a decade. The color will shift to a yellow. It'll become brittle. It'll fall off the canvas. All of those things can happen. So that whole idea of working with the artist, working with the curator, both of them have goals. And then you have the information that you're trying to provide them for them to make the best decision possible. Yeah, of course. Um, so something that stood out to me was before you were talking about, um, like that you said you usually work with like, inorganic materials and but sometimes you work with organic stuff i'm curious what the sometimes look like for you and well, 
Well, before what does that imply? Yeah. Well, before I worked here at the regional center, I actually worked at a very eclectic lodge museum in the Midwest. And my collection responsibility went the gamut from furniture to wooden artifacts to polychrome wood to ethnographic to uh, then also the inorganics and the outdoor sculpture and all of that. So I covered, I used to do all of it. But when I came here, because we have a, dis a, a distinct um, furniture wooden artifacts lab, I was able to pull back and just do the in, inorganic. But you, as you would see with the warm painting, if you want to use that as another example, the heat element was on inorganic material, if you think about it. But the painting itself is an organic material. So that's a, a, a mixed media project. And you'll get a lot of that. And um, we also deal with plastics too nowadays with a lot of contemporary art. And that truly is an organic material, but it, it's also kind of a, a paint resin material. So it can, it can, it's a lot of merging. There's never really a distinct line in anything. So, and let's say if I had a project that had a um, piece of paper involved in it or a paper um, sculpture as part of it, then it's what's nice about being at the regional center is you can go and work with your, your colleague who's a paper conservator and bring their information and knowledge into the treatment. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I can imagine just how much knowledge each, each person should, would carry just from experiences. Um, and naturally at a conservation center, there'd be this like collaborative aspect. Um, Another question I have is, you, earlier you mentioned you were working on an outdoor sculpture. And I, I, I think someone mentioned you were also involved in conserving several other outdoor sculptures around campus. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I would love to hear more about how, how that's different and other things you have to consider while working with such kind of works. Okay, well you, you realize the outdoor environment is an extreme environment. It actually puts a lot of um, stress on objects that are out there. So, and but though even though many of them are made out of inorganic materials like metals, cast bronzes, painted steel or painted aluminum, um, and they're also stone and ceramic sculptures that are also outdoors. If you're dealing with any kind of outdoor environment, you're also trying to deal with best ways. It's, it's more like a preservation and maintenance. That's more important with outdoor sculpture than anything else. So you're actually acting as a preservationist when you're not working with outdoor sculpture. So if you want to preserve a patina on a, on a certain bronze, maybe it's, it's got polished areas and dark brown patinas on, in other areas, and you want to preserve that difference, you have to maintain a protective coating on that sculpture. Otherwise, within a few years, the um, metal will corrode, turn green, or even darken, so the polished areas would, will look br brownish or spotty. And uh, some other areas may have green and white streaks on them. So that whole idea of maintaining it means that annually it has to be washed and the coating either protected, reapplied, or just touched up a bit when needed. So that, that so for outdoor sculpture, it's the preservation kind of level of conservation treatment. And then of course, then if something's been left for a long period of time without anybody taking care of it, um, such as a painted steel sculpture, I don't know if you've ever looked at the Witkin that's down in uh, the quad, but if you were here, Oh, in 2014, 2013, or something like that, you would have seen a totally different colored Whitkin. It was actually, the paint had been left to fade to the point where there was no longer any orange. It was actually a blue and yellow and kind of beigey color. That was not the original color combination that the artist had applied in, I think it was two, in the 80s. So we had a basically, decide what to do with that. And one of the decisions was we needed to bring it back to the artist's original intent, how he had applied the paint, what colors he had used and how they were applied. So basing it on models that he had and other images of similar works, as well as taking uh, cross-section samples of the paint surface on the 
sculpture, we were able to determine what the colors he actually intended the piece to be. And he actually intended to be kind of a faux um, bronze piece that had a um, kind of an uneven patina that was modeled. So we had to document the piece. We then worked with a uh, refinishing company to remove the old paint, put a protective epoxy coating on the metal so that it wouldn't corrode any further. And then we had to repaint it based on the images we had and the research we had done on the piece. So you can have the two extremes. You can have the maintenance and you can have the extreme treatment. And the extreme treatment happens because you haven't maintained it or the environment is just so harsh on, on the piece itself that you just you lose it. So that's that's kind of the two extremes in outdoor sculpture. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. I, I think it's just so, sometimes we just take for granted like the state of things of the artwork that's outside. I, I think, for example, that work. I feel like I, I've always thought it was bronze. So it's actually in, steel. <laughs> yeah, great to know. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I think that that might be all the questions we have for you today. Um, I'm sure if Emily, if you have anything. Well, thank you so much um, for speaking with us. You're welcome. I'm hoping that this helped. And some days when you guys have time, you should come by and visit. For Definitely. sure. <laughs> that, that would be so exciting. Um, no, this was really great and very insightful. And it was just very exciting to hear you talk about the work you do. And yeah, I mean, it's just so interesting to hear about how our works are conserved. I'm glad I was able to help you. And um, there's a lot of research you can do online. You can look into these the art programs and see you know, what other projects people can have worked on with art conservation. And there's also the American Institute for Conservators. So you should look in there. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Welcome. Um, thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Goodbye.